Recently, the Central Kerbin Alliance Network was able to penetrate communist defenses and discover that they were guarding the saucer. However, its origins remain unknown. This is Echo 3, and let's continue discussing the Cold War. The National Security Intelligence Service, again, would like help. The Space Center and the Intelligence Service have already worked well in the past. Now, the Intelligence Service needs help deploying an agent into the field. Hopefully, this field agent will be able to gather more intelligence about what the communists are doing with this odd saucer that they have discovered. The Space Center merely needs to fly the agent to his area of operations, at which point he will jump out of the plane and parachute down to his objective. Communist defenses may end up being a problem. It looks like there are a couple Yak interceptors coming to meet the plane. This is just a transport plane and isn't equipped with any weapons, but it does have some defensive countermeasures. It is equipped with chaff and flares. It looks like the Yaks are firing all of their missiles at this aircraft. The pilot begins banking and twisting and deploying chaff. So far he's been successful in dodging the missiles. The intelligence service would like the space center to have their plane wait around and pick up their agent right after the mission is done. However, this area seems far too hot for that. The field agent is going to have to get creative and come up with a new way to get himself extracted. The agent's chute deploys and he begins making his way down to the objective. The director of the National Security Intelligence Service, Mr. White, is also very curious about the saucer that was discovered in the polar region. He would like to get to the bottom of this mystery as well. The communists have already devoted a lot of resources to unlocking the mystery of this saucer, and it seems that the Central Kerbin Alliance Network is far behind in this area. After flying the agent in, the jet from the Space Center begins making its way back home. This area isn't very safe, so the jet can't loiter around. The agent will need to make new arrangements for his own extraction. But if able, the Space Center is willing to help. Mr. White is again asking for the Space Center's help, this time with extracting his agent. Word is, the agent has found some very useful information about the saucer. Hopefully, the Intelligence Service will share their information with the Space Center, and together, the two agencies can get to the bottom of this mystery. The crew of the transport plane will have to fly almost halfway around Kerbin to get to the extraction zone. The area is pretty heavily forested, but it looks like there's a clearing large enough for landing. Like many other players, I also upgraded my game to Parallax 2.0. It certainly makes the Kerbal system feel a lot more fleshed out, and Kerbin itself is just a lot more interesting. I really enjoyed the challenge of trying to avoid trees while doing this mission. What are your thoughts on the Parallax upgrade? And is your computer able to handle lots of visual mods? The field agent is able to safely board the aircraft. Now, it's off to secret area 15. The pilot again must find a clearing big enough for takeoff and then fly straight to the intelligence service base. The field agent hasn't spoken for the entire flight, so it looks like the space center is going to have to wait for when the intelligence service feels a little bit more like sharing. They probably never feel like sharing, but they may just need the space center's help again. But when they do, the space center will be ready. It looks like some Kerbal got himself stranded on Minmus, so Space Center to the rescue again. This is the same rocket design that was used to go to Minmus the first time, so it is already a proven craft. The craft is already loaded with scientific instruments. Hopefully the crew will be able to get some interesting data about this mint-colored moon. The launch is proceeding nominally. Jebediah is a veteran pilot, but his engineer is a bit of a rookie. This is an excellent opportunity for the engineer to gain some experience. As the crew flies low over Minmus, they spot the stranded Kerbal and begin the landing procedure. The gravity on Minmus is very low, so landings are pretty easy. With the help of the engineer's calculations, Jeb is able to land right next to the stranded Kerbal. The landing prediction guidance and the suicide burn counter really help make missions go a lot more efficiently. Upon seeing the craft land, the stranded scientist decides to plant a flag to commemorate his rescue. He also uses this opportunity to gather as much scientific information as possible and fulfill his personal mission. He seems to be very poor at flying in EVA and he smashes the magnetometer boom. Perhaps his poor flying skills are the reason why he was stranded in the first place. With the scientist on board, the crew flies north to the scientific outpost that was established on a previous Minmus mission. The goal is to expand the outpost with some newer pieces of equipment. Again. The pilot and the engineer are able to work together to come up with a very precise landing. 
Lending very close will mean that the engineer has a lot less walking to do. And again, Jeb brings it in for a soft landing. This craft is carrying some additional solar panels and some new communications equipment for this research base. The additional solar panels are added without any issue, and now for the new piece of communications equipment. Now that the new pieces are deployed, the scientist will be able to conduct a few more experiments in this location, and then the crew can go home. Perhaps when the crew returns back to Kerbin, the intelligence service will have finished going over all of their data and be able to share some information with the Space Center. Of course, the Space Center has also launched a few of their own spy satellites. Maybe one of them will have picked up something as well. As the crew approaches Kerbin, the Space Center radios to them that they have some exciting news to share. Of course, due to security concerns, they can't just broadcast in the open. The crew will have to wait until they're on the ground before they get the information. The service module is decoupled, and the capsule safely slows down in the atmosphere. Parachute deployment is good. The crew is very excited to hear what information the Space Center has to share with them. Back at the Space Center, they are told that another saucer has been discovered on the surface of the MUN. So two missions are in order. The first is to train up some new Kerbal knots. They will have a special training session on the orbital lab. The second mission will be to check out that second saucer that has been discovered on the MUN. In order to haul so many passengers up to the orbital lab and return them back safely, the Space Center has decided to construct a new space shuttle. Some of the parts on this craft are from the Mark II Stock-alike expansion mod. Before I built these crafts for the videos, I go ahead and test them on my own, and this one worked really well. The docking port in the back is obviously how the craft will dock with the space station, but it is also how the craft will decouple from the lower section of the rocket. Almost everything is on the shuttle. The last thing it's going to need are some RCS blocks to aid in docking. These five-way blocks are really nice because only two are needed on the front and on the back. It is also nice to disable the RCS blocks control over yaw, pitch, and roll, and then only use the reaction wheels for that. The shuttle and booster together are pretty heavy, so a mainsail is used as the engine on the booster section. To ensure a comfortable margin of error on fuel, some additional fuel tanks are added to the side of the booster. The craft will end up having a lot more Delta V than it needs, but the budget won't be tight. Because of the shuttle wings, large fins are needed on the booster section to help keep the craft stable. And because of that, this craft looks very similar to some of the concepts proposed by Werner Von Braun. It's time to load up all the Kerbal Knot candidates and take them into space. This mission requires an experienced crew who will take all the new recruits up to the orbital lab. While in orbit, they will spend many days doing training. One of the Space Center's most experienced Kerbal Knots, Valentina, will be heading up the mission. The booster section accelerates the shuttle about two-thirds of the way up to orbital velocity. The booster is then jettisoned, and the shuttle raises its apoapsis up to the same altitude as the station. The launch has been timed so that the rendezvous and docking will occur within the first orbit. So as Valentina plots her orbital insertion burn, it will also coincide with her rendezvous burn. I do have some tutorials on rendezvous and docking, but I like to right click on the intersection marker so I can see exactly how far away it is as I plot my maneuvers. Once Valentina puts the craft into a stable orbit, she will work on refining her orbital parameters to rendezvous and dock with the station. With the nav ball in target mode, Valentina will burn with the craft pointed in between the target marker and the retrograde marker. This will both reduce the separation at the closest to the point and the relative velocity between the two crafts. Valentina will keep doing this until she gets an intersection of less than a couple hundred meters. And because there's only solar panels on the top of the shuttle, it is important to keep that in mind as the craft performs its maneuvers. The shuttle is only a few hundred meters away from the station and Valentina burns to reduce the relative velocity between the two. The station is repositioned a little bit so that its docking ports will line up better with the shuttle. As the shuttle gets very close to the station, the control point of the shuttle is switched over to its docking port and a specific docking port on the station is targeted. The red mark on the nav ball is from the mod nav ball docking alignment indicator. It makes lining up docking ports just a little easier. After docking, Cassidy Kerman transfers over to the lab. There, he will begin processing some different scientific data. And once he's finished with that, he will transmit his findings back to the Space Center. And now the time has arrived for Johnny and Samdo to launch for the saucer that has been discovered on the MUN. The intelligence service has reported that it is likely that the area is guarded 
but they're not sure what type of equipment the communists are using. The agents were unfamiliar with the terms that the communists were using describing the saucer's defenses. It is likely that they are using some kind of experimental technology. This is the same rocket that was used on a previous MUN rescue mission with its armed rover. The last time a rover like this was used with its 30mm cannon, it proved to be more than adequate against the communist defenses. Plus, the Space Center's Kerbalnauts were already trained on how to use it. The brief by the intelligence service indicates that the saucers were not made by the communists, but that they discovered them. The one at the North Pole has already been pretty well stripped out. Hopefully something on this MUN saucer can indicate its origins. Johnny circularizes his orbit around Kerbin and then plots his maneuver out to the MUN. The MUN saucer is located near its south pole, so Johnny will have to plot a more polar orbit. After completing his Kerbin ejection burn, Johnny will have to plot a mid-course correction in order to get into the correct orbit around the MUN. The rover is pretty massive, so with only two Terrier engines, the craft doesn't have a very high thrust to weight ratio. Although that's not a huge issue for landing on the MUN, because with the MUN's gravity, the thrust to weight ratio is still over 4. After getting into orbit, the crew will have to see how well the target location lines up with their orbital plane. They may or may not need to wait a few orbits to get things to line up right. Johnny is an experienced pilot. He is also the same pilot that was shot down by communist MiGs near the North Pole. He is really hoping for this mission that he's the one that comes out on top. Last time he crashed into the water and was able to be rescued by a submarine. Here over the MUN, they may not even survive a crash, let alone have any chance of being rescued. Johnny is going to attempt to land about three kilometers away from the target area, then they will use the rover to drive in closer. Using the MUN's terrain, Johnny hopes to land in such a way that the communist defenses don't have line of sight on the landing area. It looks like landing just on the edge of this crater will provide such an opportunity. Landing this particular rover is tricky as the craft has to kind of hover and then drop the rover and then land the capsule separately. Johnny struggled a little bit, although with deploying and undeploying the landing legs, he is able to right the craft. Johnny will stay with the capsule to keep it ready for a quick getaway. Samdo will head over to the rover. It looks like one of the rover wheels was damaged on the landing, but the rover started with 14, so it's all right. Samdo gets in the rover and begins carefully driving towards the saucer. The rover's reaction wheels are powerful enough to ride it if it does tip over. The terrain looks too steep to drive straight towards the saucer, so Samdo will have to take a slight detour. Samdo now cautiously approach the communist position. Intelligence indicates that the area is guarded, but they have no clue as to what kind of weapons the communists are using here. Most likely though, it is some kind of experimental new design. Samdo activates the 30mm cannon and begins to slowly crest the hill. The saucer and the defenses are only several hundred meters away. So far, no response from the communist. Maybe their weapons aren't working or Samdo has remained undetected. What was that? The communists are shooting lasers. Samdo begins to frantically return fire. He has scored a hit. It is unclear if the defense is still working or not. It looks like he's destroyed the mounting for the weapon, but the weapon is still firing. Samdo pummels the area with a few more rounds. The laser has stopped firing. The intelligence service was correct. The communists have indeed developed some kind of new experimental weapon. Most likely, it is something that they were able to reverse engineer off of the saucer. Samdo keeps shooting the area to make sure it is completely disabled. As Samdo rolls up to the area, it looks like the weapon has been completely destroyed. The Central Kerbin Alliance Network is not going to gain anything from that. On the plus side, the area now appears to be secure. Samdo can now get out and start investigating the saucer. He says he sees a flag near the top of the saucer. He's going to go up and investigate. He walks a little closer and then turns on his RCS pack and flies up. The flag appears to be of fascist origin. These saucers appear to be some kind of experimental fascist technology. I am Echo 3, and thanks for joining me to discuss the Cold War. I will see you next time.